Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell with the Korea IT Times, and I'm here with Deanna Meyer of Prairie Protection Colorado, and I welcome you to the show Techniques and Civilization. Your well, microphone. Thank you, thank you yeah. for having me. Nice to see you. Uh, just for people that are listening in, um, Deanna and I were just in an eco philosophy uh, class with the uh, major thinker Derek Jensen, who some of you have seen me interview before. And uh, there were a lot of great discussions. And one of the particular discussions was about the extinction rate of species. And then also talking about, in particular, with Deanna, the uh, prairie dogs in Colorado. So we're going to go over that. But first of all, Dana, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got involved in this? You're living in Colorado, which is a fairly conscious um, state, I guess you would say, um, in many ways. Yeah, I just have always been really concerned about what's happening to the natural world. And uh, prairie dogs are a big part of Colorado. Um, it, they're they're everywhere that you look on up and down the front range on the short grass prairies and they were obviously being eliminated so you'd see a colony one day and then and what it would be gone and then it would be you know graded and turned into a box store and there was a particular colony that i was very concerned about that i started advocating for and we did a lot of work on that and actually got international attention about that particular colony and what they were doing because they were building a mall on really the last largest colony on the front range that had, was existing because so many of them had been destroyed and there were just smaller and smaller patches. So this was like 180 acres of a prairie dog colony on the front range, you know, in this Douglas County and one of the largest ones that was left. So we really advocated and drew a lot of attention to what was happening to prairie dogs and we saved some prairie dogs there, but the land was ultimately destroyed, which is usually what we see. It's very rare if you can save land, especially once the developers have their eyes on it. So yeah, we, I just kind of started there with that particular colony. And I was already interested in everything that was happening to our forest and just the destruction in general in Colorado with the overpopulation and prairie dogs kind of represent a lot of what's happening and they have the face, the emotions, they're mammal and people can relate with uh, the pain and the horror that they go through. And so they're really, we're a really uh, symbolic representation of what we are trying to save here. When you were younger, uh, I know you have animals there on your farm. Did you have a connection to animals, the forest, or did you have like a, an, a mentor or someone that, you know, got you interested? Yeah, I mean, I was probably the land itself, but I was raised here in Colorado and we lived um, on in, in the country. And I found my, and of course, when I was being raised, uh, we didn't have TV and or we had very little TV and we spent most of our time outside. And so mm -hmm. I was always hiking and, and spending time on on the top of mesas and spending time in the forest and in, you know, nature. So I, and I always loved animals. We had horses and dogs and cats when I was being raised. And um, I always loved animals and land. It was always my, my, my heart was always with that, you know? And so it, I always had a deep love for wild nature. It was just a natural progression then to take up some specific topic. Okay, so in the case of um, species, uh, we want biodiversity, of course, right? And when I looked at the statistics before I, as I was preparing to talk with you, I see something like 200 to 300 species going extinct daily. So this is somewhere around, could be up to 10,000 per month. Uh, is this correct? And what are you seeing there with, with your work? Yeah, it's probably even more because we don't really have any idea of a lot of species that exist in terms of like the insects and bacterial species and everything else. So, I mean, that's like an estimate. And then you take into account all of the fish and everything that's dying in the ocean. And yeah, there's it's it's very scary how fast it is. And of course, this is like 10,000 times faster than any of the extinction events that we can tell in, in our history of extinctions happening. 
So this is much more rapid and, um, you know, ra just pretty much, it's very alarming to see an extinction rate like what the scientists are saying they're seeing right now. And, and this is coming from human activity, correct? Yes, so, I think so everybody's in agreement with that. Yes. People can deny it if they want to, but I mean, it's pretty obvious. We're cutting down and destroying all of the grasslands. We're destroying all of our forests. We're way overpopulated. We're consuming like nobody ever has in the history of life on this planet. We're taking that much. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that's going to have effects on the environment. And, you know, for every reaction, there's an opposite and equal reaction and it's, I mean, people can deny it, but that's what it would be called is denial because it's happening. So, we see it. Right. And, and a lot of people are going to say, gosh, that's so big. So let's take it into your work. Now, Castle Rock is a place there in Colorado. It has a kind of a dramatic, what is it like a core, an old core of a volcano uh, there? Yeah. A dramatic yeah. rock formation. And around that area are the prairie dogs, and they're integral to the ecosystem. So uh, I'll, I'll take the position of like, well, we, if we want if we want to put like, say, a big box store somewhere, and we have to do something to the land to clean it out and all of that, the prairie dogs have nowhere to go. And you were involved with um, saving a lot of prairie dogs at Castle Rock as one part of your you know, in the past. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's kind of how I got started with the prairie dogs. And that was when they were going to build a huge mall and they did. And it's really atrocious, but on that, on that land of 180 some acres, there were thousands of prairie dogs that were living there. And so we just raised, we started a campaign that drew attention to this atrocity and we got a lot of people involved and we even when we pulled every political like trick that we could so we you know pulled a referendum which basically means we don't agree with what the city council approved and you can challenge that by getting a bunch of signatures and um so we tried we did that and that was really the major lever you know, that we used to save the colony because that created an enormous amount of pressure on the developer and um in the end where we they still poisoned them at first and then there was still a lot of survivors around like 600 or so and then we advocated for that and they stopped poisoning them and then we got a bunch of we were able to get the survivors out um yeah and that was able the the biggest thing with that campaign they live up here where i am now but the biggest part of that campaign was really drawing attention to just what's happening to land to wildlife and to the importance of prairie dogs because prairie dogs like all native species in this country are considered villains by a lot of people they're hated mm -hmm. and they're um demonized and you know on to totally through myths through untruths and lies just like you know we see with buffalo or wolves or just any native sp mountain lions you know there's all these crazy things that are said about and so you know, being able to highlight that they were a keystone because most people don't understand what a keystone species is or why or that prairie dogs were a keystone. And basically a keystone species means that if you it's like playing a game of Jenga, if you pull out the wrong Jenga block, the whole block, the whole structure is going to collapse. And that would be what we would consider a prairie dog kind of on the bottom of the big you know building. And once you take them out of the natural community or the biotic community everything suffers so and that's because so many different animals depend on prairie dogs for their food source for their uh, shelter and just just for for many things for preventing fire for a safe space for fire for they generate water so they perform they keep plants healthy so they perform all of these different functions that are essential to grassland communities and when you take them away from it then you have a cascading, you know, catastrophe on your hands. So, so these are furry little mammals, which, of course, would get the attention of a lot of people, probably compared to, say, like a mosquito or something. And they're poisoning these animals just out in, out in nature? I mean, are they, what do they do? Do they pump stuff in their holes or their burrows? 
they do a few things here in in call well everywhere but they use poisons and they have since you know the late 1800s they started using cyanide and uh, so they take grains lace them with cyanide and arsenic and dump them all over the prairies and it would kill everybody who ate it. So all of the birds, all of the prairie dogs, and they didn't really care because what the colonizers were doing was trying to clear the land for crops and for livestock and destroying all the native. That was the goal really to kill all native species that had presented any kind of challenge to that, which is everyone. <laughs> and so, but now they still are continuing and like wildlife services is a Institute of federal bureaucracy that basically kills millions of animals every year with poisons um, in the United States on behalf of ranchers, on behalf of cows, on behalf of crops and um so they still do that so the few the poisons that they use on prairie dogs are gas one the phosphine gas that i talked about called fumatoxin which is phosphine they pump that into that is the one that's most typically used um along with aluminum phosphide and things like that which are just a uh, extension of phosphide and they gas them and it's an extraordinarily painful in their burrows they pack them in they gas it and then pack all the holes down so that the gas doesn't escape and the prairie dogs die it takes them up to 72 hours for a very painful death it shuts down all of their organs and um they throw up and they bleed out of every orifice and they die in that way and um, then they also use some really even worse poisons, which are called, uh, they have their names from are called Kaput and Rosal. And they are, again, they're rod rodenticides that are um, covered in grains. So they take grains, they dump them in these anticoagulants, which basically means that it makes them bleed from the inside out. And, um, and that's literal. We've seen them use these, apply these, and it takes up to 20 days to kill them. And that we've seen them on, on top of the burrows where literally the blood is seeping out of their skin as they're dying out on top of the burrows. And that is extraordinarily dangerous, again, for and horrible, horrific in terms of humane, you know, if you want to talk about humane killing, which doesn't really exist to me. But when you're killing something, this is probably the worst way you can do it. And of course, everybody who eats the grains, so all the magpies, all the birds, all the anybody who's going to eat that and any predator who's going to eat a prairie dog who has eaten the grain is going to die in the same way. And so, but the, these are legal for uh, registered agents, people who have taken the course to distribute these really lethal poisons that can, and they make their career out of it it's legal to disperse and um yeah all kinds of birds die everybody who touches it does so that's what they use to and they basically poison all these animals before they dig up the land and turn it into stores malls or just grass for soccer or whatever it is that they want in those areas and they usually don't want prairie dogs most government officials think that all prairie dogs should be eliminated so that they can have turn that land into you know land that's for human use only. So it's an exterminationist uh, type thing, you know. As you were yeah. talking, uh, this kind of thing was done uh, not only directly to the Native Americans, but to the food to to the buffalo, for example. Uh, so in the, I guess mid eighteen hundreds. Uh, maybe you can talk about this a little bit. They have the you, you see these piles and piles of skulls of the of the buffalo with men standing on top of them. It's the same kind of exterminationist. I see you're shaking your head. Can you talk about this a little bit? This is in our culture. Yeah, and if you look, there is a picture I can show you too with a stack that's just as high because you see all the buffalo bones of prairie dogs. <laughs> so they stacked them all at the same time, like with the big piles of prairie dogs stacked that high along mm -hmm. with the buffalo. And the buffalo and the prairie dogs are what we would call bookends of the prairie. And both keystone species, yep. both necessary for grasslands, and they both depended on each other. Um, they were very important in water uh, re retention because buffalo wallows, they, they make wallows that create, that hold water and prairie dogs burrow. And then they, they recharge aquifers because they have, they aerate the soil, which makes the water drip down into the aquifers. Right now we've plugged uh, most of our 
of our burrowing holes up, whether it's voles or prairie dogs or groundhogs or whatever, and we've packed them down and now we get runoff. So that goes into the streams and that's sucked up for agriculture. So you're not seeing, so these aquifers are not getting refilled um, and we're running out of water. So that's it. But, but prairie dogs played a huge role. Buffalo play a huge role. And um, yeah, they were exterminated. There's just mass campaigns of look at what they did to the wolves. And this was all, orchestrated by what is now called wildlife services it used to be called the predator and rodent control and before that was like called biological uh surveys so this was always a a bureaucracy whose goal was to poison all the native species on behalf of agriculture on behalf of development on on behalf of of industry so that that's we've seen that happening continued nothing's changed nothing's changed at all they just continue to get more toxic poisons because animals build up a tolerance to certain things. They're smart. And then it becomes harder to kill them with those toxicants. So they use different ones, but they're not, they're not concerned about how that goes into our water supply or how that goes into the air or anything. They just want to kill these animals in the same urge as there. Lots of people think things have changed, but they haven't changed. They've just gotten worse and there's less and less of what, what used to be. So yeah, the buffalo, the same thing is happening to them. And wild buffalo right now in Yellowstone are being shot down by tribal hunters at an alarming rate. And so, I mean, and by the BLM, and they use the excuse of they're trying to stop brucellosis or whatever, and it's just no merit behind it. No brucellosis, which is another disease, has ever been transmitted from buffalo to cattle. And like they talk about prairie dogs spread the plague, that is not true prairie dogs die from the plague you know Mm -hmm. so they don't have any susceptibility to it a carrier has to be able to live and can't pass it on prairie dogs cannot transfer the plague it's the fleas that get on them that transfer it so i mean it's just this demonization of these keystone animals that were essential in holding together the grasslands this is this is incredible information i didn't know you know, the depth of this. Uh, and, and, and when you said that they they have like these keystone species, the buffalo and the prairie dog, they actually are working together, not consciously, but it's like a, it's like this complex interaction that even affects the water table, uh, the water system, probably precipitation, all of that. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it even to the extent that, well, the Navajo and Hopi, before they became so colonized, would always say to the Europeans, like, if you kill all the prairie dogs, there'll be no more rain. And so a permaculturist here, Bill Mollison, wanted to look into that because he thought usually, if not always, these these things that indigenous people, they know what they're talking about. And he found that because there used to be humongous, like right now, prairie dog populations are down to less than 1% of what they used to be. So there were up to 5 billion prairie dogs on the grasslands. And now there's millions, maybe, you know, and um, they had these huge colonies. And one of them that was still intact in Texas was 25,000 square miles of a prairie dog colony with at least 5 million animals. And um, so that's what we were seeing represented. That's what Lewis and Clark, and that was what was and had existed across the plains. And these huge burrows that they create, they have these big burrowing systems, would um, would would be able to get go much closer to the water table and the aeration that I was talking about. And the moon would pull the water up and down through these fissures, just like tides so it would create condensation just like the rainforest did so it created it brought rain and that's what Mm -hmm. they were talking about and that was that you know when when bill talked about that i think maybe it was booner who really started talking about it in his books um it was like made sense it made sense because you have all these fissures and of course they're going to be able to access deep draws of water and the moon would be able to pull stuff up and down when you had such a huge system of these burrows and now that doesn't happen so you get drought and the dust bowl happened and all of that once they killed all the prairie dogs and tried to turn it all into crops a load of uh, a lot of 
um, repercussions came from that. And we've just been able to hide those repercussions now because the fossil and we can steal water from everywhere and dump it all over the, the prairies on the soil and keep them moist to a certain extent, but that's not going to happen for much longer. Well, that's extraordinary. Just extraordinary to, to hear this. So, um, okay, so they're down to a matter of maybe millions, maybe 10 million or something from billions and billions. And no end in sight of any kind of conservation other than people fighting like like yourself and Prairie Protection Colorado. Um, it, it, it almost... It, they put a lot of lip service, like, like they try to put... Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just it makes me angry to hear. Yeah. And I mean, the wildlife officials, because people have tried to get them listed on the ESA and they... They do meet all the criteria, but mm -hmm. the, the Endangered Species Act, but in the Endangered Species Act, they also have the discretion to say, hey, we can't do this because of financial means or these would be lower than this species or whatever. So they've always pushed off the prairie dogs. If the prairie dogs were endangered, then that would be a huge detrimental, which is great to me. It's not detrimental at all, but have detrimental effects on developers, on people who want to destroy native ecosystems. And that's something that they're trying to avoid. So they put these policies in place and policies have no strength behind them. I could write all the policies I want and if they aren't followed, it doesn't matter because you can't take policies to court. You can't enforce policies. You just, so uh, with that, when they did that in the nineties, they said, hey, look, we're gonna write up all these policies so we don't have to list them. And so then a bunch of lies come through that, a bunch of manipulations on population densities come by through our wildlife officials. And um, they they also don't ever uphold or follow the policies. They just kind of say, well, the policy's there, but we haven't done anything. Yeah. So, so they, they do a lot of lip service. They get a lot of money. For example, in Colorado, they say there's a lot of prairie dogs here still around 500,000. And they base all this on flying over grasslands in the eastern portions of the state and just looking to see if there's burrows, they, which there you can see burrows all over from plains. Most of the time, the prairie dogs are not there. They're dead. They've been poisoned, whatever, and mm -hmm. or have the plague run through it. But they count them. They count the burrows as prairie dog, active prairie dog acreages. And so really able to manipulate and they don't go on the ground. They don't know if there's anybody alive there. They just count it as prairie dog colonies. And then they use a theoretical base and a mathematical equation to come up with this BS, which has no grounding in reality. So that's another way they get around not protecting the species. And they also are listed in Colorado and every other Western state that exists, which is 11 other states, as a, um, as a destructive rodent pest, as well as a keystone species. So it's very contradictory. But be the destructive rodent pe pest takes them out of any protections, including animal, like you can't ever come against a prairie dog or a coyote or any animal like that that's considered a nuisance um, for animal cruelty because they aren't even considered animals. They're cre considered nuisances under the law. So somebody could literally torture a prairie dog or a coyote in any way they yes, wanted they do. to while they're alive. And they would be able to get away with it because they're not even considered animals. So they don't apply for animal cruelty. Well, Deanna, I thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And um, yeah. I really think that this is a, a tremendous um, uh, interview learning so much. I mean, like even like the, the, the forces of the moon, interacting with the buffalo and the, and the and the prairie dogs extraordinary extraordinary um i will put deanna's information here uh, at the end of the interview and i just want to say thank you so much for your work well thank you so much for being interested and for having me on your show Great.